Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, Mike, I know that you wanted to say something really quick. Is now a good time to do that? Yeah, so uh, thanks everyone for joining and welcome. I'm Mike Peck, the scientific director of NHLBI. Um, for those of you um, who are wondering, the Catalyze funding announcements are in the process of being renewed and we anticipate them being released um, sometime in February and I'll be doing an outreach to everyone who attends this once they're released and we have a next uh, application deadline and there'll be an associated webinar coming up that we will both tell you about. Thanks, Marissa, back to you. Thank you, Mike. All right, hello everyone. It's great to see so many familiar names on the attendee list and also some new ones as well. I am so pleased to announce our speaker today, Ms. Erin McKenna. Erin is the Deputy Director and Senior Project Manager in the Boston Biomedical Innovation Center, also known as BBIC, which is a very successful life science accelerator program funded by the NIH. She is also the Head of Diagnostics and Operating Partner of Amplify, a program within Mass General Brigham that funds and operates projects that have high commercial potential. Erin herself holds nine issued patents and serves as a board observer at three biotech companies. Erin, the, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, Marissa. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So um, I'm assuming a lot of the folks in attendance today uh, come from scientific backgrounds. I myself come from an engineering background. But you know, similarly, I think we all experienced having first scientific or technical development projects that we encountered. And, you know, when I think of one of my first ones that I uh, was a part of in industry, uh, what I think about is an experience that was exciting. We were organized as a product development team. We were asked to commercialize a new product that was intended to uh, basically tamped down a new product that a competitor had released that was taking some business away from our interventional oncology uh, division. And we had a great technical team. We had a good mix of different engineering expertise. We were asked by our marketing organization to develop a particular product, get 510k clearance and commercialize it and accomplish this within a year. And we put together really solid technical plans. We executed well, we felt great. And then the product that we commercialized ended up not really realizing the potential that we had been told it would. The sales were just nowhere near what we had thought we would experience. And we felt a little surprised by that. And, you know, for me, the big lesson that I took away was that when you're trying to develop a, a technical solution, a, a product, um, there are a lot of perspectives you need to make sure are incorporated in your plans in order for them to be successful. And I think it's a pretty common experience when you think back to your first project and how you started working on it and how you decided when you know you thought the project would be complete that there were probably things that were missed and so you know if we go to the next slide uh, the the takeaway that I think comes from those experiences that if you if you don't have a clear plan then there's gaps in understanding around what you need to deliver in order to be successful and there are Lots of ways this can happen. Uh, next. So, that, you know, you might find that you, you actually don't necessarily have agreed upon expectations on what the project work should be if you haven't engaged with a wide enough group of people. In the scenario that I was talking through, um, what we learned looking back was that we didn't really engage with the clinicians that were making decisions about patient care. And as we started doing that after developing and commercializing a product, we learned that they had different expectations of what they wanted to see in order to direct patients to that particular form of therapy. And we didn't understand that. So the work we delivered didn't address those expectations. Uh, next, you know, teams sometimes don't have agreed upon milestones. Um, you can end up in scenarios where you might have some of your team believing that if you reach a certain point, 
everything else will be solved. One of the mindsets that was true in my organization at the time was the research and development leadership felt, you know, the marketing organization will sell what we what we give them. We just need to develop solid products that, that are technically very good and they will figure out how to sell them. Well, if that's the mindset, it's a little tricky to know like, well, is this really what the marketing organization needs? Have we truly agreed upon like the type of product in the end that they need to reach the clinicians they need to reach? So while on a high level, it might look like you've agreed upon milestones in the details of like what, in, what, you, what is entailed, you, you might find that, that there isn't agreement and that can lead to outcomes that are less than optimal. And then finally, next, um, you know, the other thing that happens, uh, this wasn't an issue in the particular example that I talked through, but, you know, scope creep is another thing that can occur. Uh, and this is when you start with a focus on developing one particular type of solution. And then as you go, it sort of stretches to include other product features or the scientific work makes a pivot and everyone just sort of kind of goes with it, but doesn't necessarily take the time to say, well, hold on, before we make that change, how does that decision compare to the original path that we were on? And when teams end up doing that, then they might just end up completing a bunch of work without a good appreciation for when and where uh, that work should be prioritized, um, which will make it much harder for you to deliver on time and within any aligned expectations. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, one of the things I, one of the quotes I just have always loved about planning is this one, you know, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is in indispensable. And in my own experience, I think that that is a very important concept to bring into this. Project management is not about creating precise plans that you will manage to, exactly as much as it is around understanding how you will accomplish the work, the range of ways that you may need to pivot so that you can establish a playing field upon which your team will function. And then from there, go forward and understand okay, we're in this situation, so we're going to change to this play, or hey, here's a play that we didn't think of. We need to come back together. We need to identify that we're in this position and assess what to do from this point. So we go to the next slide. You know, what I'm talking about here are more in the vein of behaviors and actions that when you're working with the team, and even when you're working by yourself, I think even if you know, you're in a context where you have few people on your team, you're still generally working with others to achieve your work. And there are specific actions and behaviors that are very effective and necessary to help you develop and bring project management into your work and help develop effective plans and align expectations. Um, next. So one of those things first off is, you got to make time to plan. Planning takes time. When I worked at Boston Scientific and I shifted into project management there, uh, we eventually developed a practice that for new projects, we would allow for, you know, at least a 90 day window to accomplish developing the initial project plan with the team once the team had been resourced. And as a part of that, we would plan for three full days. They wouldn't be continuous, but we would plan for three full days of working together to develop an understanding of the work that needed to be done together so that we could also understand how the plan uh, needs to be shaped where the critical dependencies are so that you can really build an effective uh, Gantt, but more fundamentally, an effective understanding of your team and what everyone will need to do to be able to be successful. Uh, next, um, you know, as a part of that exercise, you're defining and then constantly refining what your goal is. Um, you know, usually you can identify what you're trying to achieve in the end at a high level and some fundamental 
parts that will need to be present in order to show that you have achieved your goal. But as you do, as you're completing work, especially in the realm of scientific development work, um, you are often learning new things that impact the definition of what your end goal needs to look like. They aren't necessarily scope changes. We'll talk about scope shortly, but it's, it's really more in the vein of refinement. You have a better understanding of what needs to be true in the end goal and making time to align that refinement across the team is, is critical. Next. So fundamental to being able to plan and define and refine a goal is having very open project discussions. And I encourage whenever you can to be as inclusive as possible of anyone that is contributing work towards the project. So, uh, you know, project plans are not just developed by one person and then sent out to the rest of the team and everyone marches forward to them. Um, everyone's perspective in how the work is done, in questioning even what work is done and in what sequence, uh, as well as defining critical decision points and, and options forward is, in my experience, extraordinarily necessary. And so really encouraging your team members to not just meet, but also be open to asking each other's questions about the other's work so that they have a full understanding of what they're doing and also be open to being asked questions. Um, the goal of these questions isn't to question someone's expertise necessarily as much as it is to make sure that you really understand what it is they are doing and why they're doing it a particular way so that you can understand if any of the work that you're doing might have an impact, doesn't have an impact, um, and vice versa. Next. You know, another important part of this is being able to, you know, identify, engage, and listen. And so a lot of what we've talked about here is bringing in as many people as you can or finding ways that you can talk to as many people as you can that have, um, that play a role in your project. And it's important to consider the range of those folks. Um, so in addition to people who are actually contributing, um, in a lot of cases, there are people who are gonna be important decision makers in, you know, either, uh, determining that your team has met its goal or potentially providing funding at some point. So it, it's, it, it may be that they would agree that you've met a goal, but is that goal compelling to them? And so also thinking about who those influential stakeholders are uh, and making plans for you as a team to meet with them up front to align on your project goals as your team develops and refines them and align on your plan and align their expectations as to when you reach certain points so that they'll know, you know, when you'll share more with them and, and they can take a look and give you their perspective on you know, uh, how it's going and what they like and where they're concerned. Um, but then making plans to engage with those folks regularly is also important. And so, some other part of the teamwork that needs to be uh, built in to your plan. When is that happening? Who is leading those engagements, et cetera? And then we have one more. The one thing I really, really try to push hard on is not to build silos. Um, again, when we get back to the, uh, this idea of having healthy conversations and discussions within your team and around your team, the conversation focus is, should be as much as possible about just making sure that there's clarity and understanding around why the work is being done the way that it's being done and also being open to other ideas that people might share about how the work could be done, um, coming from a perspective uh, of just, you know, really curiosity and, and thinking about 
what are the potential, what's the range of options on that playing field? If, if we're not doing this, is there a reason why? And being open to having that conversation versus potentially interpreting those types of questions as uh, an attack on expertise. Obviously, I think you need to make sure that the team develops good communication norms so that people feel comfortable having those types of conversations. And that kind of norm setting is another part of, you know, establishing a team that's important to kick off. There are a lot of different resources out there. I'll point to some and some places at the end that you could look for finding things like that and tools like that. But it is important to make sure that your team feels comfortable enough and not in a position of uh, being questioned or 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 feeling the, the need to be defensive. Otherwise, it, it, that, that kind of behavior impedes having the types of productive conversations that are necessary to avoid kind of a, you know, the worst case scenarios of project team behavior, like the group think that led to the challenger disasters, for instance. So um, if we go to the next slide. So, you know, the prior slide started with a, you know, define and refine your goal. Uh, in general, I think, you know, you're taking on a project, you want to start by defining a single project goal. I know sometimes this can be challenging, especially in the space of thinking about developing technologies that have a wide potential of application, but I think that there are still ways to think about what do we want to accomplish at the end of this project that will help focus efforts so that you avoid the potential for that scope creep type scenario or just a, a project team that is sort of working against one another in its worst case because expectations aren't aligned and, and folks are just coming to their own interpretations of what you know, you're trying to achieve. So um, it, next, as a part of that, there are some important questions that the team needs to discuss. You have to really be aligned on the purpose behind whatever it is that you're trying to develop and those stakeholders that we just talked about. Who, who has a stake in this? Who is gonna be important to convince that we have succeeded? And uh, how do we make sure that we're aware of their perspective on what this is and what they wanna see? And you know, refresh that regularly during the course of our project work. You want to also be clear about your knowledge gaps. So, um, you know, what do you know at the point that you're at right now today, both about the technology that is going into the eventual, you know, product you're trying to develop or the product itself that you uh, understand from the work that's been done date? What does that product need to have as well as where are the open questions um, in understanding how the technology will be developed to successfully deliver on the product or understanding aspects of the product that haven't been defined and, and then making sure that your plan contains actions that are in, you know, in, focused on addressing those knowledge gaps, um, you know, in addition to developing your technology. In a lot of cases, these kinds of gaps may not have much, if anything, to do with the, the advancement of the technology. Um, so really thinking broadly about these is uh, an, another important exercise and another way that engaging a wide group of people uh, in the collaboration on the project as well as in your stakeholder group can be helpful in surfacing those types of gaps. And then really making sure you understand your limitations. Um, you know, we do not have, in most cases, even within industry, you don't just have all of the funding to do all of the work all at once. Um, you usually need to try to focus down on accomplishing uh, you know, a narrowed set. And so really thinking carefully about, you know, based on these time and resource constraints, what can we accomplish and balancing that against the goal is, is an important exercise uh, to work through as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, you know, there's a deeper level then once you've identified a goal of really defining what success looks like. And if we go next, um, one thing that I like to think about is, you know, really developing a solid picture of what you need at the end to show that you have achieved your project goal and really describing the components of what needs to be true. So coming from the medical device product development space, I would not just think about the product, I would think about 
the package. I would think about how it needs to get to the clinicians that would use it. I would also think about the clinicians and how are they learning to use this product? Well, do they need training or is it self-explanatory? So you just start trying to think through everything that you'll need uh, in order to achieve a success. Um, you know, for a, a technical project, it could be in addition to delivering um, results in the form of a publication, you're also thinking about um, how are you presenting those results to the important stakeholders to help your team get either the recognition or the support that will be necessary to continue work forward. But to me, I would include that all in the bigger picture of like what needs to be true in the finish and then go back to where you are right now and work backwards, basically. Um, it's a, it's, it's an helpful exercise to, to go that way versus start from where you are and then try to build a plan going forward. Um, and then your scope, uh, as we talked about, has to then be influenced next by, you know, the general categories that we talked about before. So we have time. Um, sometimes you, you time is going to be fixed and there's only so much you're going to be able to do, which might lead to refining your scope as you go and narrowing it further from where you originally were focusing. Um, you know, in addition to people and funding, um, you know, these these things influence your scope uh, just as much as what you're what you're trying to achieve. Um, so next, I think I have a little statement in here that just summarizes all those things. It's your goal plus your constraints. Um, and if we go to the next slide, so you know, as I've talked about before, multiple perspectives are are necessary. If we go to the next click here, I think, yeah, and one more. Um, I'm just going to show, you know, all of it together. We have a lot of technical elements in the context of developing a medical device, which is where I like to play, um, you know, that, that come from technical expertise, but then really understanding the non-technical side, thinking about what you understand about like who's using your product, who's using your solution, what, what are the barriers to them wanting to use your solution, um, as well as other aspects that are necessary to be able to realize your solution. And this framework can even be applied into, you know, I'm thinking more about commercializing a product. If you think about even just trying to develop a, a clinical study, there are aspects of thinking through, well, what's the process for IRB review uh, that I need to undertake? Do I need to engage the FDA to be able to, you know, have a protocol be approved and move forward with this particular study structure? Um, and just making sure that you're bringing in people that understand these things, uh, as opposed to stretching yourself, you know, a lot of technical teams tend to just focus a bit more on saying, well, maybe I'll just learn regulatory, I'll read the guidance, I'll interpret the guidance, and that should be enough information for me. Really trying to make sure that you're bringing in people who have the expertise, um, you know, wherever you can to help you uh, ex understand what that space is, even if they're not on your team, is an important part of uh, what you need in your plan. And there's ways you can do this. If you can't incorporate those perspectives as a part of your initial planning exercise, then bringing a plan to someone before you've gotten very deep into executing and asking for their perspective on, you know, is this a strong plan? What am I missing? Is another way to get it. But I think it's fundamental to just make sure that you're getting those perspectives early and then often as you go um, for anyone that, you know, has those areas of expertise that are going to be critical for you executing that, you know, if they're not on your team. If we go to the next step, or next slide, sorry. Um, the knowledge gaps that we talked about before, as I said, um, can potentially live in a lot of different places. Next. So there's technical gaps. While maybe you understand a core technology, there's aspects of implementation that while you can imagine that they are surmountable, the actual work needed to surmount them hasn't been done yet. And you will likely discover other challenges along the way. So um, if we go to the next slide, 
you know, in a lot of, or a lot of cases, as we've talked about regulatory strategy or thinking about how you can introduce something into a clinical evaluation or how you can introduce something into a market, um, you know, or even how you can conduct an early assessment. It's not being used on patients, but you want to get feedback from clinicians requires some thought around understanding, well, how would I how would I navigate that? What applies to what I'm trying to do? Where are the experts there that can help us digest that? And especially so for new technologies that don't explicitly fit all the categories of what's been done before. Uh, next, intellectual property is another space that um, sometimes presents some challenges. While you know, when you're doing product development, you usually start with some level of intellectual property um, that exists, you, that's gonna be built upon. There will be other entrants that might come in and ch change what the landscape looks like. And so, you know, th there will be, you know, gaps that you'll be looking to address along the way. In addition to just those core ones of, continuing to advance your intellectual property at the stage it happens to be at. Typically, projects don't start at the point that patents have been issued. So there can sometimes be challenges that emerge throughout that process. And then finally, you know, another common area of gaps just gets back to what is needed um, what do patients need? What do clinicians need? And based on those needs, how does the existing landscape look right now? as well as what else is potentially coming that would impact what you're trying to develop. And just understanding that to then think about what other information you need to build into your plan. Um, throughout your plan, these knowledge gaps will never go away. You will reduce them, um, but there will always be things that will be happening that you won't be able to control. I'll touch back on that in later slides. But for now, if we go to the next slide, so, you know, I think if you're used to thinking about uh, the terminology that you find in a lot of grant applications, um, it's important to maybe think a little bit more about what project management terms mean starting from that perspective. So next, if we just think about, you know, aims, which are generally what are described in grants, those tend to be broad. Um, they might describe what an entire research program is trying to accomplish. So there's a lot of space in there for refinement, um, you know, or, or reinterpretation even of what that goal means. Um, whereas, you know, project goals are much more focused. Um, you have to define at another level down, um, you know, while, you could argue under a broader aim that achieving a very different goal from what you had started might look like success in the context of your, your focused project that was looking to deliver on one goal. That is successful only if when you started there, your team specifically made choices along the way that were informed by the stakeholders that making those changes made sense versus sort of landing there, you know, and potentially delivering a product or a solution that really wasn't the one that people wanted or needed. Um, and then, you know, when we shift into milestones and deliverables, we start talking about, you know, quantifiable achievements in a project, and then points along the way of a project where you can make decisions. And so if we go to the next slide, So just digging further into milestones, milestones will have tangible deliverables for stakeholders to review. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, there are usually reports, um, there are, there, you, you might have built something that people can see and assess, is this what we need? Is this not what we need? Um, in general, milestones are not one-to-one -one with deliverables. And what I mean by that is you usually don't just complete one deliverable and have everything that you need to assess whether or not your project is going where you need it to go. You know, let's think about what the metaphor of a milestone is. A milestone is not necessarily every mile marker. All that's telling you is you've gone another mile, you've gone another mile. But, you know, when you reach an intersection and now you have a choice to make on where to go, the milestone needs to incorporate 
a, information from a couple of sources. So it could be that you are doing some technology development, you are talking with clinicians, and then you're incorporating all of that information to determine which direction should we go in? Um, you know, and that to me is really what a milestone is. It's it's a little bit more than just telling you where you are and executing. It's it's a point at which you are coming together and actively deciding how are we going to execute from here based on what we've done before. So you continue, you adjust. Maybe in some cases you stop um, what you're doing, but but you're actively determining where you're going to go next. So we click next uh, on the slide. So, you know, part of what's key here is you can identify these milestone points along the way. The other thing that's important to do before you get there is really define what success potentially looks like in that milestone. There are go, no go milestones that help you understand like um, we either can or can't achieve something. Um, and if you can't, then what are the options and thinking through what the, they are before you get there? Or in a lot of cases, there are, we could go left, we could go right milestones. And how are we going to make a decision? And what's the information we need to make that decision? And so as a part of that, you also have to agree on what that evidence is, how it's going to be collected. That's got to be built into the project work that leads up to those milestone points. And then you need to be able to explain how you know what success looks like, how you will show the milestone has been reached. And this is where that perspective of your stakeholders is important because it's not just in most cases your team making that assessment. It's those people outside of your team that need to champion what you're doing that need to agree that that's the case. And, you know, I've found that um, one way that you can uh, plan to help make better uh, milestone decisions is by when you reach these points, trying as much as possible to pull in uh, like an independent perspective, someone who hasn't been working as closely with you that can really scrutinize with fresh eyes what your, what your team's been doing and ask questions that should hopefully challenge uh, to make sure that you've really been able to show that your milestone has been reached. If we go to the next slide. So deliverables are outputs from activities that are completed to reach a milestone. I like to think of them as the nouns. They are the reports, they are the prototypes, they are the results of interviews. Um, you know, uh, as this, uh, beautiful picture of a road shows here, a road trip that doesn't have defined duration or destination, it still has stops along the way where you need to be able to, you know, achieve certain things to, to continue on your journey. And um, if you click again on the slide, um, you know, even if where you are is in an earlier stage of hypothesis-driven research, I think it's important to still think about what milestones you will need to reach decision point milestones, go, no go milestones, um, so that you can understand, you know, where you are, at what point it makes sense for your team to come back together and assess when the next steps are. Um, so, you know, I think that it's possible to define milestones in support of assessing a hypothesis even, um, and that that structure can still be very, very helpful for teams that maybe are not in a place where utilizing a structured Gantt chart makes sense, um, especially for any kind of a collaborative effort. So if we go to the next slide, another rubric that I like to use that I'm guessing a lot of you have probably seen is the SMART objective, uh, you know, rubric. And this to me describes the work that you're completing you know, as well as the deliverable. So next, you know, I think, uh, you know, here's a, here's a high level objective. You know, we wanna complete biocompatibility testing in the course of a project. Um, but this doesn't really contain, well, it says biocompatibility. There are many different types of tests. Uh, so it makes it a little less clear, like what, what tests, is, so it's not really specific enough. Uh, and also by that nature, it's not necessarily measurable enough, not really clear what we're completing this testing for through this uh, uh, stated objective. And we certainly don't have enough information to understand if it's realistic. 
there's no mention of time bound in, in this objective at all. So a refined objective next looks a bit more like this, you know, so now we're specifying the type of study that needs to be completed, that it's in support of a regulatory filing that is approximately a six month window away from where we are today. So, um, you know, this type of exercise is important when you're thinking about how to define the work that's needed uh, to deliver the results. So if we go to the next slide, something else that I really like to do, and this is me showing my engineering nerd side, is I like to build flowcharts for project planning. Um, and these are just some general, like, these are flowcharting, uh, basic flowcharting symbols with project start endpoints. I like to represent milestones as the diamonds for making decisions. Um, deliverables can just be, you know, uh, drop down. This doesn't necessarily show it. Some of the uh, solutions you can use have the little wavy line on the bottom. So, you know, that, that can be helpful. And then processes um, are words. Sometimes these are combined into the same symbol as well. Uh, sometimes it's a helpful exercise to break the work away from the deliverable because sometimes you need to complete multiple actions to get to a deliverable. So um, if we go to the next slide, so, and I'm just going to ask you to click like maybe three or four more times, Shane. Thank you. Um, two more times. Yes, there we go. All right, perfect. So, um, you know, what I like to do with teams is basically go through a flow charting exercise using post-it notes. And you give everybody on your team a, po a little pile of post-it notes. You can use different colors for milestones. You can use deliverables in the work as different colors, or you can make that be the same depending upon what you're doing or what's easier for everybody to understand. And what you do is you put one either deliverable or deliverable work combination per post-it note, only one. You don't wanna write the whole plan on one post-it because that will make it harder to do the next step, which is then, you know, as each person on the team does that, you, you take a big chart kind of illustrative of what's on the right there, and you just have people assemble their post-it notes in what they see as the order of what needs to happen. And it's important to have people do this individually while also creating a central place where you can put these post-its and gather the results. It's It will look messy at first, but what you'll start seeing are certain patterns. You will probably start seeing some places where people have, you know, many of the same post-it note that looks the same on, on all of their flows. Um, and that's, you know, to be expected because if you, you know, have enough understanding about what you're trying to achieve, then there's going to be common elements. But then you'll also start seeing either places along the way where people have identified a particular you know, need for work to occur that, that is unique. And that's another place that is helpful to have people talk about that. Well, why do you think we need to do this particular study before we get to this point? Um, you know, and uh, the great thing about using post-its is that you can easily move them around. You're not locked in, um, you know, and, uh, you know, this is also something that if, you know, even in these times, if you can't get together, um, you can still do something like this by having people assemble their own flows and then explain their flows, and it can introduce the same conversation points. Either, yep, I agree we need to do that study, or, well, wait a minute, why, why are you thinking we need to do this work? You know, other pieces of information that are important to think about capturing on the note, and I know it looks like this is a lot for one little note, although they do sell big post-its now that you can use that really, you know, were designed for this type of exercise. Wherever you can, when you're talking about a process, when you're talking about the verbs, I think you wanna talk about what you think the time will need to be for completing that work, as well as what other things you need to complete that work. So you might need a deliverable that somebody else has to give you. So, you know, pointing out that you need that is important because as you're figuring out the sequencing, having visibility to that will influence where that sticky note goes and help the team recognize why it needs to go at a certain place in the plan versus, hey, you know, this doesn't have any dependency. So really we could work this anytime. Um, so if we go to the next slide, 
I just have some tips on, you know, ways that you want to estimate task time, because this can also be a point of conversation that's helpful. Thinking about the type of task it is, is important. So, you know, the project management terms on fixed unit, fixed work, fixed duration, what they speak to are just different types of tasks uh, from a work standpoint. So in the fixed unit tax task, this is a situation where it just doesn't make sense to pile a bunch of people onto the task. This is either work that a particular expert needs to do or work that by its nature just doesn't necessarily become more productive when more people are trying to do it. So writing a report is a really good example. The duration of the time of the task might change depending upon how big a report they need to write, but you're not really going to go faster, nor does it make sense to say, well, you know, let's try to get that done quicker if we add more people. So that would be a fixed unit tax task that could have a variable duration um, but it's still going to be one person or maybe two people on that task. A fixed work task is a task that you could add people to and it would go faster. Um, and, you know, that's helpful to know because if somebody's telling you, well, I think this is going to take us three weeks, to understand that if they had another resource during those three weeks, that maybe you could get that down to two weeks is important. And then a fixed duration task is, you know, in a lot of cases, there are studies that just need to run for a particular duration of time, or you're sending work out to a contract lab and they can't give you any better than maybe a 48 hour turnaround on this test. So even if the test is only gonna take a particular amount of time, it's that duration and you just have to count on it, you know? Um, so things like that are important to just think about when you're estimating time and, and then asking your team members, well, why, why does it take two weeks for this? So that you can explore if there are other solutions. Um, so that kind of trickles into the multiple perspective side. Um, another little tip that I've learned over the years is, you know, when people say a task takes two weeks or longer, that probably is a sign that that's a place that you need to have a conversation because two weeks or more usually means that there are other tasks. So maybe this one task is, you know, actually has three or four hidden tasks and you want to break those out into different stickies. And especially if there's opportunities in those tasks to find other ways to collaborate that would, you know, reduce time or improve efficiency, um, you know, that's, that's an opportunity. In other cases, you might just learn that you're relying on certain resources and maybe there are other resources that might just be able to get something done faster. So if there's uh, you know, one lab that only promises this turn, but we know of another one that could potentially get that done faster. Um, you know, I think anytime you see something like that, it's always to me a sign of like, hey, that's when you want to have a team conversation. And then this is where you also want to go back to that considering dependencies and sequencing, especially when you're trying to think about um, understanding the sequence of where your critical path is and then looking at longer duration tasks and thinking about your op options of, you know, how you might be able to reduce time or, uh, you know, just make the workload easier for the whole team to manage all at once. And as a part of that, the other thing I'd like to eventually work to, if we go to the next slide, um, is that, you know, uh, when you when you get to a point that you have enough understanding and confidence in your process flow for your project, I like to try to also put it in more of a swim lane configuration where you organize the, the, the each lane by the person that's performing the task. And so from here, you can find places where, you know, individual tasks need to combine. And then the, this, this person is dependent upon the outcome of, of uh, you know, the programmer is dependent on the outcome of the chemist and the engineer's work in this case. The other thing this can potentially highlight is when you might have a lot of tasks that are hitting one particular resource at the same time. And that's another, you know, way to then go back and say, well, is this, is this sequencing the right plan for success? Or are there ways that we could maybe unpack this, uh, spread this work around, um, you know, how much of the, what are our options here so that we don't potentially set ourselves up to fail uh, by overloading a critical team member at this point? Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, 
I think one of the important things that's important to, to keep in mind uh, as we're building something that looks very fixed is, you know, product development and technology development is also a highly iterative process. So if we click ahead and keep going, two more or one more, sorry. Yes, perfect. So, you know, there's design work, prototyping, you get feedback, you perform tests, you keep looping around. Um, sometimes this means that it's tricky to accurately predict that things will go in a straight line. So if we go to the next slide, I'm just gonna touch on and maybe click two or three more times that there are a couple of different varieties of project planning uh, strategies and frameworks to work in. Um, waterfall is a traditional one that kind of describes, um, you know, a single product launch at the end with a lot of dependencies built within the plan. This is kind of at a high level outlined in design control guidance, but I think other frameworks such as Agile and, and Lean that have more iterative approaches that show multiple reviews and multiple points that you might be engaging external people to your team to ensure that you're going in the right direction or that you bring in Lean that essentially says, let's focus on solving this problem first, build a very detailed plan to go get that. And then once we've done that, let's go back and refine the other plans. Um, you know, all of these potentially help in getting through balancing a framework of a plan against the, the iterative aspect of the work that we need to do. Um, you know, and I think it's important to just bear in mind that developing these flowcharts is not meant to lock people in as much as just have a better understanding of how you need to achieve your work um, that needs to be up for discussion. So to shift to the next slide, you know, it's important to remember your project plan is a living document. This is not locked in stone. You are meant to use it as a reference point and as you're proceeding, adjust it as, as you go. So if we click at the next point here, you know, you set a goal, you build a plan, but then next, you know, you're gonna start making progress. You'll monitor your progress. And then next, you know, you're gonna learn new things which means that if we hit next, you know, you're going to be just working in this loop of potentially rebuilding the plan and refining as you go, but going back to the framework to just make sure that you understand the impacts of things before you start executing on them is such a valuable exercise uh, and can really help your team just be better equipped to be nimble. It feels like it could be more burdensome, but I can tell you from my own experience, it's much better than just jumping in and then discovering things that had you had a conversation, you probably would have discovered. So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, there are lots of types of unforeseen uh, events that occur when you're developing technology. Uh, you know, if we click ahead, um, you know, there's all these, although I feel like it's hard to not point out, like, what about the situation we're in now? Uh, the whole pandemic has certainly been a big example of unforeseen events that throw off the, you know, technical development work uh, or, you know, any team that's trying to achieve anything, um, you know, and, and led to, in a lot of cases, a lot of these things occurring. So, you know, I think that in addition to the things that you're going to plan to learn, there will just be things coming at your teams that um, are gonna be unforeseen. And this exercise is helpful in understanding how to respond. We didn't expect this. Let's go back and look at our plans. Let's think about how this impacts things and let's adjust our course. So um, if we go to the next slide, I think some of the key takeaways are, as I mentioned earlier, you know, generally when you're making progress in a project, you're improving your certainty, you're improving your likelihood of success as time passes, but you're never really, it's, it, you're never really approaching 100%. You get closer, but there's always a chance for other information to emerge and you need to be vigilant for that. And that's what these tools are designed to help you do. Um, 
have that picture of the playing field and understand like what is on your playing field, what are the different plays you might be able to deploy uh, based on what you might foresee and recognizing when you didn't foresee something that you need to go back and refine your plans. It's a behavior much more than it is a set of tools and the tools are really there just to help you in, in, in supporting the behavior. So on the next slide, this is just a list of things that I find are helpful, in particular, the flow charting exercises and determining your decisions. Um, you know, I, I like, you know, I'm biased a bit towards Microsoft projects, you know, pro, uh, products, I should say, coming out of industry. But I think that there are certainly a lot of options, and in particular, you know, Google Drawings or Lucidchart are tools that have been developed for use in a you know virtual setting that uh, make it easier to collaborate on what these flows are and have multiple people that are moving things around. You know, in addition to utilizing project planning software platforms, I find that really thinking through your flow before you start putting things into the platforms is important and that will give you a lot of the information you need to make those platforms really work for you and your team. In addition, I should point out Project Management Institute, <coughs> excuse me, is a wonderful place to find more tools and more behavioral support options that you can look for to bring to your teams. And they have a lot of free uh, things in addition to things that might be there more for members, but I would encourage folks to take a look at it. So if we go to the next slide and click one more. Um, I hope this was a helpful uh, presentation and I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Erin. That was such a well organized and informative talk. I really, really appreciate it and feel like I can speak on behalf of everybody. Um, does anybody have any questions right away? You can either type your question into the chat or the Q&A box. Um, you can also select raise hand and we'll be able to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question to Erin orally. Okay, here's a question to start us off, Erin. You've described many great strategies for project design and development. How do you recommend PIs and their team members who might be naive to these processes to not be overwhelmed or not know where to start and how to access some of these more nuanced project management processes? Well, and that's where I think I like to really start with that flow charting exercise and really just getting people to talk about the work and the way that they understand the work. Because um, it's, you know, there are certain tools that you can learn, but I think, <laughs> excuse me, it's helpful to just start from that place of just talking and sharing what you know about the work so that you can then try to get a sense of how the work needs to flow. And, you know, to me, that's, that's not, a specific tool that you need to fill out. And it's important to me to, that you don't start by saying going to a tool like a Gantt chart, because I think that's overwhelming, frankly. There's a lot of information that needs to get entered into a Gantt chart. And instead, just starting from a place of saying, let's everybody talk about what we know about the work and be open to questions from everybody else is the most fundamental place to start. And then as you get that information down, it becomes a lot easier to look to the tools and then look at the information and then talk with your team about like, hey, I, I think we might be able to use this tool. What do you think? Um, so I think the other important part of that is calibrating with anyone on the team, what types of tools have they used in the past to manage efforts? You know, teams don't necessarily need to adopt all kinds of, you know, tools out there. Some things are, can be managed in things as simple as an action item list or, you know, Microsoft Teams or other interactive platforms might just give you enough visibility to understanding if, if we just use a task manager, will this be enough to help us understand how we're doing? and how long it's gonna take. So I just encourage teams to really focus on making sure that they're understanding the work and then looking at whatever tools make sense for them versus you know uh, diving in deep and getting overwhelmed with like, oh, I, do I need this chart? And then this one, and this one has to connect to this. It's like, 
start from that place. And I think as you, as you go, you can just pull in the pieces and, and be open to learning about project management to bring in more and refine as you get better at it. Absolutely, thank you for that answer. We have one more question. For a startup, the iterative process is so fast. How early is too early to start the detailed planning you described? Yeah, I, I think it, you know, never too early because to some extent, like, you got to be speaking to what investors want and how quickly can you get it. And if you're not doing some level of background work in at least elements that you see as being the most critical. So if your investors have told you, like, we really need to see this happen, going through that exercise to really make sure that if you're going to tell them, well, if you give me X number of dollars, we can make that happen in, you know, Y number of months, you know, I think it is important. Now, do you need to do that starting from all the way at the end that in the end, we're going to have a full product and it's going to need training? You know, you could potentially just frame it in like, we need to get to this point that investors have said they'd be willing to support us beyond this. And let's focus our, our project planning efforts in detail there. Beyond that, you can put in higher level assumptions. You can say, look, we know generally we're this regulatory path. It's gonna take this long to get an approval, but we haven't gotten into the details of it because the most important thing we need to focus on is getting to this point. So I would certainly encourage you to scale your project planning efforts based on where you are. Great. And Shane, I think we'll take this opportunity to go ahead and launch our poll for our participants. Our poll is only five questions. Um, it'll take 30 seconds to fill out. So we really appreciate that feedback. And while folks are doing that, I will ask Erin one final question. And that is about the importance of having a dedicated project manager versus a PI who adopts project management principles. Um, you know, what I would say there is um, it's uh, I encourage people that are not project managers to learn about project management. Um, it is its own discipline, but even within industry, it is often a discipline that people start from a technical role, become a project manager, and then shift in a different direction. Because it, it when you're in that role, it really gives you a very deep appreciation of the breadth of people that need to come together to uh, deliver successful outcomes. So, um, you know, I think that there's certainly value in trying to engage somebody and a lot of teams reach a point, especially if you're trying to develop a product or stand up a company where bringing in a dedicated project manager will become necessary. But I also think it's important for people to feel willing, even at early points, to really look at these uh, look at the space to mine up best practices that will help you develop with more confidence projections on what you think you can achieve with what resources in what time frame. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, Shane, could we go to our last slide? Perfect. I would just like to take um, a second and remind everybody that we do have upcoming seminars. Our next will be held on February 8th again, 12 to 1, and that will be hosted by Dr. Renee Arnold, Entrepreneur in Residence at the NIH, um, and she will be talking about reimbursement in health economics research. Um, and one more point before I thank Erin, and that is that there is a project management guide on the Catalyze.org resources page. So that is our Catalyze uh, website, and we have resources available for PIs and teams to access there. So with that, thank you so much, Erin. This was great. We're so happy that you were able to join us today, and um, thank you again. Thank you. I'm glad I had the opportunity. All right.